Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and today I figured since I'm going to be moving soon and I was about to disassemble this thing, I may as well do an overview of my test box and robot testing setup, as well as go over the safety procedures that should ideally be followed in order to safely test combat robots. We've been seeing a lot more cases of people posting videos of really unsafe weapon tests of combat robots and not really respecting how dangerous these bots can be and the kind of damage that they can dish out to not just other robots, but a human being in their fingers too. So I figured this would be a good opportunity to go over how this box was constructed. You don't have to build something exactly like this, but the key points are polycarbonate top, in my case, that you can see through. You could do polycarbonate walls as well, but it's a lot harder to build that way. I have the polycarbonate enclosed by some toggle clamps to seal the box. So if these are both engaged, you can pretty much pick the entire arena up by this clamp and it will not disengage. And uh, that prevents the polycarbonate from sliding out or buckling upwards or anything. And to load the robots in and out, I just slide it back like this. I have some nylon 3D printed uh, slider guards here that are plenty strong to prevent me from being able to pull the top off this so a robot can't do that either. And in my case, I'm actually using two eighth inch thick sheets of polycarb, but a single quarter inch thick sheet would be perfectly fine. Three millimeter, six millimeter equivalents um, also work. So you can see here I have a blue tinted quarter inch thick panel that I can use as a replacement. It actually warns you specifically, you need to make sure that any holes in polycarbonate are spaced away from walls and corners because they create huge stress risers. And it's just generally advised to avoid screwing polycarbonate down. And if you do do it, you need to make sure you use washers and that you space the holes appropriately. And also make sure that you are drilling a hole that is three millimeters bigger than the diameter of your screw for clearance so that you aren't accidentally threading into the polycarbonate, which would create even bigger sites for stress risers. It's also recommended that you can cut it with pretty much any woodworking tools Bandsaw works best, but a table saw, a jigsaw, or even just a regular woodcutting handsaw works perfectly well. So the way this box is built is I basically just got a bunch of two foot by two foot by three quarter inch thick MDF uh, squares from Home Depot. You can buy them already cut to that size, or you can buy a four foot by eight foot sheet and they have panel saws in the Home Depot stores and you can just ask them to cut it down to size for you. Oftentimes they'll do this for free. Um, so you can have them cut to whatever more or less exact inch sizes you need. So if you're going to do that, um, it works out great. For the floor, I don't actually have it secured to the rest of the box in any way. I can pick up the box with these handles I screwed onto the sides. And right now it's kind of taped on, but ordinarily you could just pull this whole thing up and the floor would just fall out the bottom so that you could swap it and replace it easily when it gets damaged like this. Um, I think that a four foot by eight foot sheet of MDF costs less than $40. So, and that's more than enough to make an entire test box and have extras. And then you can get polycarbonate um, quarter inch thick two foot squares on Amazon for also 35 or $40. So the cost to build this is really low. And then holding all of the size together, I have these really cheap uh, corner brackets you can basically get whatever whatever metal angle brackets are the cheapest at the Home Depot that you frequent and uh, get some wood screws and just bolt it all together. So I have one here, one at the bottom on each corner. So there's eight of these in total holding the whole box together. And then I just found some, some uh, sheet metal at the Makerspace also that I grabbed for free and cut to size. And that's not even held on in any way. It's just kind of hammered in so it's all pressing up against itself on the edges. Um, but ideally you would probably put some screws through it to stick it to the walls here as well. Um, that pretty much covers everything that I have in my box. Could make it only one foot tall if you're not using a robot-like division that likes to launch itself towards the ceiling all the time. I've made a couple upgrades to my test box for the sake of both aesthetics and filming. So first of all, you can see I've painted it. Second, I actually have some uh, remote controlled LEDs in here. They just turn on white and you can change the brightness and have them flash or whatever. Um, those are just some, some LED strips I got off Amazon. And then I also added this ring light, which I power off of the same 12 volt source as the LEDs so that I can get a nice bright 
filmable inside of the box. And I can just stick a GoPro to the underside of this polycarbonate or stick my camera right on top to be able to film through the top without risking my camera being destroyed, which unfortunately kind of did happen to one of my GoPros that was inside the box. So you can see in here, there's quite a bit of wear and tear. You can see that Division's done plenty to the floor as it is. Um, and I've repainted it several times with obviously some mixed results. Um, I just used some cheap flat black paint and then cheap 12 volt LED strips. And you can just get random 12 volt like four amp power supplies that'll run any amount of LEDs that you want to run. I have them just pretty much super glued and taped to the uh, sides here. They don't, the sticky backing that came with them doesn't like to stick to paint very well, but if you didn't paint your test box walls, they might stick fine. And then I have this aluminum foil here just to prevent this super bright ring light from blinding me every time I look down from the top into the box. You can also see I have these, these are just glued on, these like little wooden pieces that are just scrap I found for free at the Makerspace. This just gives something for the clamps to kind of clamp the carbon polycarbonate against, but you can also slide these plungers back uh, as well and have it grab onto this lip, so that's not totally necessary. And the one at the back here makes it easier so that when I have the polycarbonate slid all the way forwards, um, it can kind of pass below this edge. And if this lip here isn't raised up above the back, then when I try to push it back, it'll get stuck. So that also helps there. So the correct robot load-in procedure is the following. First step is recommended that you turn on your transmitter. All right, so now I have the transmitter on. Next, a robot with weapon lock inserted gets put into the box. Then turn on the robot. Now you remove the weapon lock. Close up the test box. And now you can test. Okay, so it looks like I have a drive side that got pinched or something, so uh, that's something to investigate. Now, to show the procedure for taking the robot out of the box, first we have to unlock the test box lid, slide it back. I'm going to insert the weapon lock while the robot is still active, then turn it off, with the transmitter still on this whole time, by the way. And now, I can safely remove it from the box. If for some reason you have to work on your robot in the pits with the battery still in it, like in this case, um, it's imperative that you make sure that the weapon cannot hurt you. Uh, normally this would mean working with the weapon lock-in, but in Division's case I actually can just remove the uh, weapon belt from the uh, weapon entirely, so it's free spinning now and the motor cannot spin the weapon if it were to engage. So in this case, I think I had some wires pinching up against this motor. Um, to check, I'll just turn on the transmitter. I am also doing what's known as a wheels up test. So the wheels are not touching the table or the test box lid in this case because the robot's propped up on something. This is really commonly done in the pits and it's strongly recommended you always keep your robot like this when you're working on it in the pits. Aha! Uh -huh. Looks like there's a loose connection here somewhere. Alright, looks like in this case I just had this solder joint break loose from my XD30 connector, so that shouldn't be too hard to fix. Alright, so now after hopefully repairing the issue, I can do another wheels up test real quick. We can see this is now getting power as it should. All right, I'm going to go over the load-in procedure one more time here. So first things first. Transmitter on. Weapon lock is in the robot while it is off. Load the robot in. Turn on the robot. Remove weapon lock. Then seal up 
the box. And we can test. For added safety, I actually have a switch on my transmitter that won't let the weapon spin unless it's enabled. Um, I have a video on how to set that up. It's called an arming switch. So right now, you can see I'm pushing the throttle stick and it's not doing anything. I enable this switch, and then it allows me to spin up the weapon. And if I disable the switch again, it doesn't move the weapon again. Now to unload. Everything in reverse order. Put the weapon lock into the robot. Then turn off the robot. And lastly, turn off the transmitter. So yeah, that just about covers how I built my own personal test box. I will link my safety video that I made like a year ago in the description, and I'll also link a bill of materials that you can use to replicate more or less this entire setup if you would like to. Um, has like toggle clamp links from Amazon and the MDF and everything that you need really. So yeah, hopefully this will help reduce the number of unsafe spin-ups that we see in the future and help to keep everyone safe. Thanks for watching!